All right, so um, we, alhamdulillah, the online team who's been working uh, to help our online viewers sent me questions. So I'm going to start there because they um, have patiently endured our breaks and such. Um, their first question, which is a very common question, uh, do you have book recommendations to learn more about these uh, beautiful women who we spoke of today? And I'm assuming they want uh, English book recommendations, if you can. Um, just simply, I'm, I'm answering, may Allah forgive me, just because we finished last year a whole class. It was a whole year class at Jannah Institute where we covered first is the, we call it the pearls around the Rasul So we covered the woman around the Rasul including his wives and his daughters. There's more than one book. The, for those of you who read Arabic, one of the most beautiful, and I'm sure you know it, is um, Bint al-Shata, uh, Dr. Aisha, it's called Sayyidatu uh, Bayt al-Nubuwa. It's in Arabic, Sayyidatu Bayt al-Nubuwa. It's not translated, right? However, there's a very, com very good books, actually. Uh, Woman in Islam, it's written by uh, Dr. Tarq Swedan. Very easy read. This is for those of you who don't know much yet. Just you want to read, very easy, uh, nicely um, written. I think it's written originally in English because you can tell. So it's called Woman in Islam. That's one. Sayyidatu Bayt al is the second one. Um, there was a woman around the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. It, I didn't find it as a book, but you can, hopefully you can find it, meaning PDF, but not a real book. There's a lot of resources about that. I, I recommend for all of you to start with, start with The Woman in Islam uh, by Dr. Tariq Swaydan. It's very easy read and will give you a lot. The idea, and please forgive me if I'm gonna add a little bit, is not to read a lot, read with depth. Read as you really wanna know who's this woman. You know, we gave you like a, just a little bit today, just like a little bit examples. Go in depth, spend an hour or two with every page and feel it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will open it for you. Uh, the next question is uh, specifically about um, who to study with. And I think one of the amazing things that we have before you, we have many organizations present today. Um, and all women, so you're safe wherever you go on this panel, alhamdulillah. <laughs> um, so maybe if you, I'm just going to pass the mic, we'll start with, uh, we'll start from my right, because you're on my right. And then we're just going to, where you teach and how people can best contact you if they want to see what you're doing in terms of teaching. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I have literally nothing to add. I mean, these are literally teachers. I'm so embarrassed to be here. Um, I have a class on Swiss, which is looking at the ahadith and ayat that women have frequently asked about relating to women. Um, and then there is also uh, uh, projects I'm working on. Inshallah, they're going to be released next year. Um, but that's the only one that you can access online. I'm going to so stop now. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. <laughs> Um, alhamdulillah, I just moved here in August. So our halakha uh, on Stanford campus, so if you're on in the area, um, it's every Thursday at 6.30, at 6 as long as the quarter is in session, inshallah. We're actually covering the seat, which is really exciting. I'm really excited that you're there. Um, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Sorry, there's some uh, Cal Berkeley and Stanford rivalry going on up here. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Okay, alhamdulillah. Um, mashallah, the Rahma Foundation welcomes everybody, inshallah, for you all to join us. Um, the halakas are, it's a little easier this way, the halakas are on Friday nights. Um, they start at 8 p.m. They have been for the last couple of years virtual. Um, inshallah, there's a possibility, if please, big dua, if it works out, inshallah, that we might have a hybrid model starting in January. Um, for those of you who've been part of the halakas, we meet in that conference room right there, inshallah, every Friday night. So we hope you'll come back and join us in person again. And for those who aren't able to, we'll do them, uh, continue to do them virtually as well, inshallah ta'ala. That means also the girls' programs. Please make dua 
lot because for about, I don't know, 10 years nonstop, we've had girls' halakas as well, parallel with the women. So we hope, inshallah, those will resume. Bi'ithnillah, with your du'as. And then um, Rahma Foundation recently also um, started their halakas on Clubhouse, for those of you who are on that app too. So make sure, inshallah, that you're following either on the Zoom or on the Clubhouse, inshallah, for our halakas. We also have a lot of classes on the website. If you are looking to take like a full series or something very focused, you can go to the website. All of it's free and you can take a whole course that way as well. I don't want to forget the website. Um, and then, um, where do you teach? Who are you, Ustada Hassan? <laughs> She's everywhere. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, so, Jazakallah khairan. Thank you, mashallah. You, you understood the assignment. You got Alhamdulillah. So I teach here at MCC uh, Thursday, the last Thursday of every month. Alhamdulillah, we have a sister's halaqa open to all. It's a total open door policy. I actually do it only monthly because I know we have so many time constraints. It's hard to do something consistent. You're free to come and go as you like. Marhaba. I also have Clubhouse uh, that I'll be starting new sessions. Actually, this coming week, I'm doing two classes. Uh, Alhamdulillah. By, uh, by the permission of Sheikh Hamza, which are the purification of the heart, the diseases of the heart, as well as agenda to change our condition. Both of these, he's, he's translated and, and written both of those books. So those are on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's on Clubhouse, so it's a very simple. If you don't have the app, I personally, I know I actually saw some social media related questions. Social media, as we know, is a very dark and toxic place, generally speaking, but there are some, what I call like light or lamp posts, you know, some places where there's some light. Uh, Clubhouse can certainly be one of those. I know, mashallah, Sheikh Maryam does uh, TikTok and, and Instagram. She's amazing. She's she's everywhere. May Allah give her tawfiq and bless her. Wallahi, I am so comforted when I see her in these spaces because she is a huge lamp post. <laughs> but on Clubhouse, it is a space that's a safe space. So I welcome all of you to look into that. It'll be starting this Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, 1 o'clock on Tuesday and on Thursday. Thursday, 4 o'clock, inshallah. That's all. Um, we have Jannah Institute. Some of you I know are taking classes with us. There is two ways you take classes with us. Um, there is the Quran, we call it the Quran department, where you can memorize or learn Tajweed, Arabic or in English. And we have one Tajweed in Urdu. Then we have the Islamic studies, where we have been running classes for years now, alhamdulillah. Just this year, we started in September, Year of Knowledge, which is a one-year program that every Muslim woman should learn. And we covered five topics, which is science of the Quran, fiqh, hadith, tazkiyah, and aqidah. Um, we are about to finish our first semester, starting, inshallah, afterwards. If you want to join, email me. The team will kill me, but that's OK. Um, but you have to, uh, all, the, uh, all our classes are online. Subhanallah, because we know women, it's not very easy for them. So everything is online, and then they are also recorded. All the books are online, and we teach traditional way. You read the book. We read the book in the class, and we explain it. And also, we have our free Tuesday program. Some of you, you probably know this. It's on YouTube. Every Tuesday, we have Tuesday program. Most of the uh, speakers here were actually guests. We try to have once a week or uh, once a month or twice a month guest speaker woman, and the others I do it. it we, we tackle different uh, topics. This is what I will say at the end. You want to learn? Allah will open it for you. And this is exactly how I was advised 20 years ago. Ask Allah sincerely. You want to learn, but put this next to it. It's not an easy journey. He will test you in every step, and you have to keep going. Be consistent, be sincere, and he will open to you without you knowing where to start. Assalamu alaikum. I've been away for 30 years, so, uh, and I'm here on a short visit only. But I do want to say that, subhanAllah, uh, it is something that really gives me, yeah, it's a coolness to my eyes and a pleasure to my heart to see after 30 years so many Muslim scholars and uh, knowledgeable women doing all this da'wah work, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. A uh, couple of questions about dealing with um, oppressive family where they're not allowing uh, women to be treated as they should be treated as Muslim women. So they've heard, you know, you say wonderful things about the rank and status of Muslim women. What about when the experience at home with family or uh, at work or, or with friends is not that way? What, what should be the response? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. 
السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, I mean this is a very uh, uh, general question I would have to know exactly are you talking about uh, a husband or a father or a boss uh, exactly what is it that isn't going what is it that's difficult difficult is it a difficulty or is it abuse is it uh, uh, a parent or is it a husband? For each one of these, there's a different answer. Uh, in case of a marriage, you have a way out if there's real abuse going on. If it's just your normal, uh, uh, difficult uh, person, SubhanAllah, Allah taught us women how to defuse such situations and how to uh, uh, work as a team with our spouses, no matter how difficult they are, if they're normal, difficult people, not people that have problems um, in telling us to obey your husband subhanAllah that is when when a situation comes to his word or mine just to give in to something that is not so major is something that makes him feel that he's still in charge and that makes him uh, a softer human being and a more you know you're dealing with with someone that has kindness towards you and uh, is, is not f fighting you. But uh, uh, SubhanAllah to constantly uh, wage a war and a battle in, uh, in a marriage uh, for whose word is going to be, who's, who's, who has the last word on, on everything is uh, toxic. The, the environment becomes toxic. And uh, so it's, you know, it's up to you whether you are going to realize that this human being has been put, Allah chose this man to be under your care. Someone who has faults, so do you, but someone who needs your acceptance and needs your patience and needs your love and needs your kindness in order for him to become a, a, a stable, a, a, a fulfilled human being that can give back to you what you have poured into him. Perhaps, no guarantee. But the reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is it that helps women and, and doesn't let you feel that you are a victim when you are in such a relationship? The idea of you're obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not obeying this human being. Every relationship in Islam is a triangle. It's you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then that other human being. So when you're obeying him, it's not because he deserves to be obeyed. Sometimes you're wiser and more intelligent and you have more knowledge and more experience. It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked you to do so. And Allah asked you to do so in order that you can live a peaceful life. Little by little, you will see that he becomes a more balanced person towards you. Um, if it's a parent, then it's a different story. You cannot divorce a parent. And I've heard of toxic relationships, you know, with toxic parents. Or, SubhanAllah, I don't subscribe to this. I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us to treat them in the best manner possible and uh, know that everything that you are going through and the most difficult parents are the old parents. The older they get, the more set in their ways, the more uh, childlike their behavior. Um, therefore, what I'm saying is if it's a parent, being good to that parent despite all their difficulties and hardships and, and the hardship they're putting you under is something that you are gaining the closeness, gaining closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through. If it's a boss at work, well, some difficulty can be put up with. There's no place that's perfect, but you can find another place. So what I'm saying is, what relationship are you talking about specifically? But the most important thing is for you to know that any relationship is a triangle. You're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you give a reaction to the other person. It's not a tit for tat. Jazakallah khair, very well said. I'm going to ask, add one thing. I, subhanAllah, I was planning to say it, but now Allah made me remember. There's a saying to, they say it's to Imam Ibn Atta al-Sakandari, قومي حيث أقامك الله ورمقامك حيث أقامك. Your place is where he put you in. You know what that means? So if he put you as a, if he put you as a wife, that means he wants you to be serving him, him, not your husband, as a wife. No, I really mean this. If he put you as a single mother or a single woman, that means you are his servant in that status. So abusive, and I, a woman come to me a lot about this. I have only one line. I said, where are you more pleasing to Allah? Inside this marriage or outside this marriage? 
if you are more pleasing to Allah inside this marriage, meaning you can take it, you are absolutely patient, and you look at your akhirah, then you stay. If you are not, even if there is not really a lot of abuse, she just can't stay, then absolutely leave. Exactly what Sheikh Hassan said. Put Allah number one in your formula. Difficult parents, that's the toughest one. Because this is, there is no uh, plus and minus. It's in the Quran. He, made, he put it together. Allah had decreed, you worship not but him and treat your parents with excellence, ihsan. And then he specified, because you know when it's going to get tough. When one of them or both get to the old age, and you know how difficult it is with an old age parents, especially these days. Don't say off. So what do I do? It's very difficult, Sister Haifa. I say, turn to Allah. Say, Ya Muyassar, Yassar. Ya Allah, you are the one who makes things easy. Make it easy. Do you think he will not listen to you? He will have this relationship, cry to him, run to him. So there is choice and there is no choice and Allah will make things easy. The microphone has to go here. I have a happy question. <laughs> okay, good, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so we have sister, uh, this one? Yeah. Just say I want, because this is an online question. Sister Julie and Sister Lisa are asking, how do I become a Muslim woman? Uh, how am I to dress to come to the masjid for the first time? How do I convert? So if you are in the East Bay, we welcome you to come and see uh, Stada Hosai, who's, who's here, who will meet you anytime, day or night. <laughs> um, if you are, yeah, so just let us know, message us, um, and we can connect you to somebody where you are. We can virtually meet you now. You can, you're, we'll put anybody you want before you. I will be so honored. <laughs> Dr. Haifa will come in person. We are happy to welcome you into our community. There's no special uniform to come to Islam. Exactly. <laughs> Just the heart, right? Is ready. If you're ready, we are welcome. We are welcoming you to join uh, our community. Isn't that a happy question? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Yeah, keep the questions coming. Um, let's see. I'm trying to find another happy question. Okay. So, uh, so, okay. so I, we gave okay. each uh, each of you a stack. If you can look at your stack and do an overall answer kind of uh, with your questions, we'll go all the way down. Yeah, we'll start with you. We'll go all the way down because we're hitting up uh, on, on Maghrib. Okay, so I had a few questions that were related to rebuilding a connection with Allah. This kind of summarizes the themes of those questions. What are realistic baby steps we can take to getting closer to God when you feel terrible about your spirituality, effort, and your relationship to God? One of the important things that um, I think many of us underplay is how much individuals can impact how we feel about ourselves and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you are, as a child, were constantly hit to read the Qur'an, um, or maybe you had a teacher who spiritually abused you in some way, and Dr. Rania is the expert on this, may Allah bless her. When you have a relationship with Islam that started with parents who used hellfire to threaten you to get you to go to bed on time, like, when Islam has been used in these ways, which is not from the revelation, it's not from the sunnah, to teach Islam in these very literally painful ways, a lot of times, as an adult, you can have an aversion, may Allah protect us, to prayer, to du'a, to Qur'an. And I've, I've encountered so many people who ask me this, like, how do they process wanting a relationship when the beginning of the relationship started with a very painful experience? And the first thing to recognize is the fact that you want a relationship speaks to how strong your love is for Allah. That despite what you've gone through, you haven't said, Islam, la, la Allah, may Allah protect us all. I've met many people who have made this statement that they don't, they don't want to associate. I mean, the fact that you want to is a sign of the strength that you want your iman to be. You want it to go in that direction. The second thing is realize that sometimes we project the way that we feel about ourselves 
onto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I don't like myself, if I loathe myself, if I can't get over a sin I committed five, six, seven years ago, months ago, weeks ago, and I'm constantly making tawbah and I can't, can't, I can't even imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiving me. And so I assume that because I hate myself so much, that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees me. So then I've met people who say that they feel embarrassed to pray because they don't think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would want them to pray because they're not righteous enough for prayer. For every type of worship, someone has said this, whether it's salah or hijab or walking into a masjid space. Versus Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps telling us that anytime we go back to him, we are sincere in our repentance, he accepts and he forgives. And that we do good deeds to wipe out the bad. So realistically look at yourself and think about where does this feeling stem from? Some of us are really just caught up in life. We're caught up in life, we're impacted by social media, we're just caught up in the dunya, that's very human. But for others, there's some reason why. Examine what that is for you and work on healing yourself from a spiritual place with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what that looks like is A, for example, working with a Muslim therapist if you've actually gone through trauma. The second thing is creating new experiences with worship. You don't let someone who raised you or who, not raised you like a parent, but like maybe they were your Islamic school teacher, teacher, someone who when you were 13, who did something so horrific you never told anyone, they don't get to say whether or not you're gonna pray when you're 27. Don't give them that power. You have the power by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will to choose to pray today. Don't give anyone that level of, 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 uh, importance in your head when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who can help you overcome everything. So you choose it's going to be your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you build new experiences with that relationship. So let's say when you used to read Quran, it was in a very, you know, in a very particular room. Choose to read Quran on the beach. Read Quran at a cafe. Read Quran taking a hike. Re-establish new experiences with the Qur'an so that your brain makes new neuronic experiences with that, that worship. And make sure you have very consistent worship. Obviously, we have salah and we have the fara'id. But beyond that, number one, read the Qur'an every single day. I didn't know Arabic. I read it in English. The Qur'an changed my life. Changed my life in English until I learned Arabic. So every single day, take a certain amount in whatever language you can understand. If you can read Arabic to do it, even if you're super slow, do it every day. One verse, five verses, one page consistently. That's the first thing. The second thing, there's a very beautiful book on Sirah. It's called Muhammad Man and Prophet, peace be upon him. It's by Adil Salahi, A-D-I-L-S-A-L-H-I. It's like over 800 pages, but it's so beautiful about the Sirah. I really recommend going to that book for the Sirah. And for a Quran translation, I recommend Mustafa Khattab. Dr. Mustafa Khattab has a beautiful new translation, mashallah. And the third thing is work with mentors. Find sisters, mentors, shaykhat that you can study with. Because a lot of times you're going to go to a random Islamic website to ask about a woman's question. And you're going to walk away from there going, how do I process that answer? Instead, seek mentorship with real people who have institutes, you can study with Dr. Haifa. Like how honorable is that, mashallah? With Asada Husay, with Ansi Sosan, with, with, Dr., with, Do, with Dr. Rania, with Asada Amina. These are, peop these are women who are really here, here, here to support your process, inshallah. So make sure that you know that you don't have to go through this journey alone and that anytime you doubt yourself, remember, if you doubt yourself and you wonder where are you with Allah, it's because you care about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now, what do you do? You reevaluate yourself. I'm here. What can I do to get to a higher place? Until you reach that place, what can I do to get higher and higher and higher? Inshallah, sincerely for the sake of Allah. It's really hard to talk after people that are your heroes. Subhanallah, but following up on that, one of the questions unfortunately says, What do you do when you feel unworthy of God's love? Allah. You are worthy, you are worthy, you are worthy. These aren't my words. This is the Prophet ﷺ telling us this. When we talk about the angels, it's scary. You know what, what, if you're an important person, there's people that write everything you do. Allah created angels to write what you do. You are so worthy. SubhanAllah, I remember going to a session and, and, and I remember the scholar saying, Allah loves everyone. Some people realize it and some people don't. 
The question isn't if Allah loves us. The only question is if we are able to realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Allah has been feeding you, He's been clothing you, He's been giving you people that love you since the second you were born. How can I now come and say Allah doesn't love me? Even those who disobey Allah, Allah feeds and closes, closes them too. Allah loves you, that is the default. SubhanAllah, I think we also make it so difficult of like, oh, I need to do this, and one day I'm going to learn uh, Arabi, and I'm going to memorize the Quran, and then I'm going to get it. You know what you should do? Make dua. Just ask. You're asking the creator of the universe. There's nothing that he can't do. Just ask. And that dua, dua mukh al it's the, it's, it's the essence of all of our worship, everything you're doing, essence of it. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no barrier. Why are we creating stupid barriers? There isn't one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, if you walk to me a hand's length, I come to you an arm's length, you come a yard, arm's length, I come a yard's length, you come to me walking. I come to you running, just go. Just ask Allah. And every step you take for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not a matter of like, oh, I need to do more. No, it's a matter of quality, of focusing. Someone was saying with all the distractions of 2021, what can I do? This isn't the distraction. There have always been distractions. Like the Muslims, they became Muslim under literally threat against their lives. Alhamdulillah, it's so easy for us. All we have to do is ask. Just ask Allah. Ask with sincerity of like, Ya Allah, bring me closer to you. What's the path? Which way? Ya Allah, point me in the direction that pleases you. And be honest. Follow that path, subhanAllah. There was... Um, Sorry, there was another question just about Sayyidah Fatima radiallahu anha about being Ummi Abiha. We talked a little bit about motherhood and the reason we talk about this is this is the most obvious example of love that we witness as human beings. And, and sometimes your mother is difficult and you end up in therapy for years. I don't want to <laughs> discredit that. But as a general rule, when you see a mother, like her baby's throwing up in her and she's like, oh, isn't this the cutest thing in the world? <laughs> like, motherhood is mind boggling, subhanAllah. It's that depth of love that she gave to her father, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She gave to everyone around her. It doesn't necessarily have to be a blood relation. I have like, there's so many. Alhamdulillah, there's so many, both men and women in my community, where I'm like, I think you should do this with your life. I think you're great at this, and I'm so grateful that they take it from me. Like, who's this crazy lady that's telling me what to do with their, with my life? Alhamdulillah. But part of that love, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna end with this because it's my one of my favorite stories from this year. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam during the hijrah. There's a moment where they're trying to pass the, their guides telling them, like, mind you, if you, like, they're during the hijrah, so if you, like, if you capture them, you and your family are going to be rich for the rest of your lives. And the Prophet sent them, they're trying to go around a place, and, the, and their guide tells them, we can't go through the crevice of the mountains. There's two thieves that are right here, this is their spot. So the Prophet sent them, says, oh, that's people I can talk to. So he goes between the crevice of the two mountains and he starts calling out to them, saying salams. You can imagine the two thieves are confused. Like, you know we're here. And you're, what, what is happening? And they come out and they talk to the Prophet ﷺ, and he asks them, what are your names? And they say, Nahnul Muhanan, we're the two low lives. I thought they were calling themselves low lives. That was the name their tribe gave them. That's how bad this was. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Bal antuma mukraman. No, in fact, you are dignified. And he speaks with them and he tells them, I'm going to Medina. Join me in Medina. They stopped thieving and became Sahaba. This is what this love does. It sees your potential and says, how can I help you get there? You are in fact an incredible creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not ever let anyone belittle you, both in the community and out of the community. I want you to know, I got kicked out of my fair share of masajid because if you come and tell me women can't pray here, they're like, I'm like, oh, here? Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Yell at me when I'm done. Because my Prophet Sallallahu said, you're not allowed to ban me from the masjid. Also, there's a salah time and I can't miss it. So <laughs> yell at me when you're done. When we look at these women, you wouldn't push them for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and they'd be like, oh, I'm going to give up this space. If it's for Allah, they're going to do it no matter what. SubhanAllah. May Allah accept from all of us. Sorry for taking so long. Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. 
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. There, the number of questions that are here are mostly related to mental health and things related to, not, not surprisingly, mashallah, but things related that are very important, related to um, either depression or anxiety or feeling disconnected or feeling like we don't know how to reconnect, feeling like Iman is low, um, you know, just summarizing the various things we have here in this uh, pile. And uh, one thing that I wanted to share, and I said this during the talk, and I said I'm so excited that one of my own teachers, Ansa Sosan, is here, subhanAllah, because there are so many lessons that, um, that I personally have learned on this topic here, and I'll answer, I'll come to this in just a moment. But one thing that I shared, and I just want to remind us, I mentioned in the talk that when you feel that there's something really heavy and it's really difficult, the question often when you go to the teachers of spirituality, our teachers of deen, they often will ask, what have you done about this so far? And the answer isn't like necessarily step one, two, and three. Those are there and practical and important. But it's also, have you made dua? Have you talked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The people close to Allah would say, if it really, really is that big of a deal for you, then it's something you get up in the middle of the night and pray about and you make your tahajjud, and you call out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, otherwise is it really all that big of a deal, right? And we talked about how the Prophet sallallahu would go little by little by little, increasing, 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 until it became large amounts of time, closer to the prophecy, before he got nubuwa, to Allah hira, to do what? To contemplate, to do that tafakkur, a contemplation, People like to use the word meditation. We have our own word, which is called <laughs> contemplative meditation, right? Kind of connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of us have that. All day we spent here today, mashallah, together, all of us together. So it, it, we happen to be in the masjid. Often we're in these conference rooms or other rooms as women. And we recommend the concept of i'tikaf, the concept of that spiritual seclusion. Having that time alone with Allah, and what I learned from Ansai Sosan was so beautiful. This concept of the pressure cooker, <laughs> which is that we all, for anybody who's used a pressure cooker, Ansai would tell us that there is that valve that allows the steam to go out. And if you don't have the valve opened, what happens to the pressure cooker? It explodes. And I remember my own grandmother's kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> there was this huge like, thing on the ceiling because once she had a pressure cooker that exploded, one of the old time ones, and she was terrified of it, would never use it again. And every time I would hear Ansa say the story, I would think to myself, yes, if you don't have the valve to let the steam out, you too will explode regardless of how good or not good things have been. Even good things cause you to be tired and fatigued. And that pressure cooker valve is the atikaf. It's the time you spend in isolation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you spend alone, that you beseech him and call to him and connect with him. We don't have that many people who do this because I know in every time we've been in that conference hall and we've talked about atikaf and I've asked a room full of women just as much as this room and more, how many of you have made atikaf in your life? Let's see. Yes, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. The, 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 <laughs> the hands are more because wallahi in years past, it would be one hand, two hand, three hand out of a hundred women. Now we're seeing mashallah more hands because this concept has become more well known that a woman, not just a man, should also be doing this atikaf, this kind of spiritual connectedness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, these are some of the roots of how do you pick up your iman again? One of the questions was how do I pick up iman again? Talk to Allah. Anything that's important for you, you make time for it. Right? You want that degree, you want that job, you want your kid to do this, you want that, you want this, you want that, you want to lose weight, you want to work out. You, want, you make time for it if it's important to you. Is this connection important to us? That's the real question. Because from there, then we can build. And the rest of the question, this is where I'll wrap up, inshallah, the rest of the answer to the questions about what do I do if I'm feeling depressed? What do I feel if I'm feeling anxious? What do I do if I, you know, fill in the blank. Connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is where we start the conversation. But do you remember the second thing I said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That he had that connectedness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it was heavy, he went and isolated and had that time to really rejuvenate. But then what else did he do? He asked for help. 
He confided in Satina Khadija. He went to her and said, I think I'm going crazy. He went to her and said, I'm scared. He went to her and said, I don't know what to do next. And as somebody who was able to have the wisdom and guidance, she helped guide him in that. But see, so many of us, we keep it in, we keep it in, we keep it in, we keep it in, and then like the pressure cooker, we explode. And that, that affects us and our children and our children's children, and it's a cycle, a vicious cycle that just doesn't end. So inshallah ta'ala, that's, those are the beginnings of the steps, inshallah, and there's many more from there, but those two will get us very far, and they're in direct example of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Takbir. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan. I have just a few questions here that were related to uh, topics that, um, that uh, are, are similar to what I cover in the classes I was mentioning, the purification of the heart and agenda, which are, you know, how, any tips on seeking validation only in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, very difficult to do this age, day and age, unfortunately. How do we embody um, beauty inwardly and outwardly without becoming prideful, vain, or arrogant? So relating to spiritual diseases, and then uh, other questions as well relating to not caring about what other people think, like really prioritizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think, you know, as I would have answered this in, in one of the classes, I would have said we have to focus on really self-purification because the, the day and age that we live in is so focused on the external. And as I mentioned in the talk, this is a really toxic message that deduces women to just an object, it's objectification, it's exploitation, it's devaluing, it's taking away everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised us with and just focusing on the part of us that is going to go into the ground and literally be worm food. So we have to know better that the soul that resides within this case, this shell of a body that we all have, is far more important to beautify and that requires mujahid and nafs, it requires the uh, tazkiyah process, right, to actually cleanse yourself and struggle against yourself, right? We mentioned this, this uh, even uh, Dr. Haifa mentioned the dua, right? right? Don't leave me to myself even for the blink of an eye because we have to know that self works against us. So understanding that we, the external pressures are actually not as, uh, don't focus on those. If you focus on those, it's very hard to manage. But if you look inwardly and say, I have to reconcile myself, right? My nafs is working against me. My nafs is riddled with disease. I have to start cleansing. And you don't, you know, as our mashallah physicians on the stage know best, you have to diagnose, which is why, as you know, Dr. Haifa mentioned, you have to ask those questions, like why am I not doing certain things? What is the barrier? What's, what's preventing me? So if we're worried about whether it's prayer or again, being vain and having pride and arrogance, you have to get to the heart of what is it that, where's the root of those? How did that start? And then also know how to identify those diseases, right? This is why learning the, tes uh, you know, the topic of tasqi is a big part of our tradition. We have to go back to that, learning what the spiritual diseases are, applying the remedies that are offered to us by our great scholars of the past and present, and just being in the practice of those things. And then as well, you know, being in, in spaces like this, mashallah, with other women so you don't feel alone. Shaitan, this is one of his tricks, which is also another part of this, understanding that Iblis is the other, you know, major threat, enemy. We have the nafs that's the greatest enemy, then Iblis, then dunya and hawa. If you know this, as uh, Shaykh Abdullah calls it, the, the axis of evil. <laughs> you know, it's the four evils that we are all, they're always orbiting us and they're always either, you know, around us. We have to recognize them, but... Uh, you know, working uh, to, to with those two especially the nafs and iblis, knowing how he works. What's his you know what's his playbook? How does he get into us? So when you uh, read, if you don't have the book agenda, uh, they uh, Sheikh Hamza and Imam Zaid have outlined what they refer to as the eight inroads of the spiritual uh, of the heart. Right? What are the access points that iblis gets us to? The first one is prayer. Because if we're not vigilant about our prayer, then you know obviously he's going to come in. He's gonna have full reign. He's gonna fill you up with a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas and just destroy, you know, you know, plant those weeds to destroy that spiritual garden of your heart. So you have to, you know, be very uh, mindful of the prayer. And then what is it? Your eyes, your ears, your tongue, as was mentioned, mashallah. All of the beautiful reminders we heard today. Your hands, your feet, your uh, private areas, your stomach, all of these are inroads. That's how Iblis gets to us. So if you don't know how to you know, be vigilant, how to guard those, 
you don't understand spiritual diseases, then yes, we're going to unfortunately accumulate disease the same way a person who doesn't watch their diet, who doesn't exercise, who isn't mindful of their time, starts to accumulate physical diseases. So it's all very, very similar. But those are the general answers I would give to all of these. And once you shift your focus, as mashallah, and Sosan reminded us beautifully, focus is so key. If you don't have your focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're worried about people and, and numbers and, and you know followers and friends and trends and being popular and being accepted, then you're gonna have a very difficult time. But if you shift that focus to Allah and start working on you know really healing yourself from within, inshallah Allah will give you tawfiq bi'adhanillah. And just briefly, because I forgot to mention this in the talk and it relates to uh, something that Dr. Amina answered in her question regarding does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love me? You know, we were reminded many times that there are so many people in our history that are nameless, right? We don't know their names. Like, uh, you know, the, the woman who swept the masjid, right? In the time of the Prophet I mean, the Prophet was very upset that she had passed and they didn't tell him that she passed. He wanted to pray over her. But we just know her as, you know, the woman who swept the masjid, or the hairdresser, right, in, in, in Asiya's story. This hadith just, subhanAllah, when the Prophet ﷺ was experiencing the Isra wal Miraj, okay, he's on the greatest ascent, right? I mean, he's literally, this is the highlight, the peak of, of, his, of his experience, right? In, I mean, in, in, um, in, in that moment, he said, a smell came to me. He didn't know the smell, and he asked Sayyidina Jibreel, like, who, who, what is that smell? Where did that come from? And he said, that is the fragrance of the hairdresser of this story of Asiya. Her, her fragrance is in Jannah. It's, it's throughout Jannah. He smelled it. She is significant. So a lot of times, shaitan makes us feel small and invisible. But we have to remember, it doesn't matter if people know you. And I am sure I can speak on behalf of everyone here. Just because, you know, you have a public name or a public persona, it, this is insignificant. It is, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, am I prioritizing him? That's all that matters. That's it. And if you do that, you are very, you are known to him. He loves you. It's a, and he'll confirm that for you. But don't look at things from these, this, these, uh, the lens that this dunya teaches you to see that your value is only placed in your external, your beauty, how much wealth you have, how much money you have, whether you're married, whether you have children, insignificant, right? Insignificant, it's all about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, as I said, you know, there may be many of us who, who uh, you know, in the future, no one will know us, but inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he of course knows us, he made us, so inshallah. Jazakumullah khair, and I'll, I'll pass the mic now. Barakallahu khair. Jazakallah khair, assalamu alaikum. There is question is different, but I'm going to cover the woman prayer because that's something It's very surprising that we're still in the United States where masajid are open to the woman. We don't live in a country where it is not. And still some women don't know that the woman can pray in jama'ah. And I'm not saying about you. I hear this all the time. There's two opinions about that. There is one opinion that says the woman does not pray in jama'ah. And that's absolutely respectable opinion. I say this all the time. Who are we to judge these scholars? And there is the other opinion says, yes, the woman absolutely, and the woman lead them. And Sayyidah Aisha used to lead the woman. So if you are of that school or that other schools, you are absolutely fine. And the other one, which is really, I'm glad it was asked, can we pick up the child during Salah when he's crying? My answer, please do. Because you are annoying the Musalleen, and this is harming the Musalleen is a sin. Absolutely pick up the child. And I think you mentioned it in the story of Sayyidina, Sayyidina Fatima. He picked up Al-Hassan al Hussein. He prolonged, alayhi salatu wasalam, prolonged his sajda because they were on his shoulders. So absolutely you can do that. Um, there was a question came in, like Sheikh Maryam spoke about uh, Sayyidina Maryam. Is she a prophet? There's a different opinion about that. The strongest opinion, she is not. Imam Ibn Hazm, Ibn Hazm is a Zahari school. Again, without going into the technicality of it. It's, it's a school where it goes exactly what the Quran say, just the external meaning. That was, it's called a dhahir. But the stronger opinion that she is not, prophets were only men. And there is the answer, why? You know why? Because Allah said so. Done. Learn this answer, ladies. When people ask me, why you wear your hijab? My answer is Allah said so. I don't have to explain it. Of course, I will later on for other reasons. But number one, why do you fast? Allah said so. Why do you lower your gaze? Learn this. Teaches you submission. 
teaches you to be Al-Qanitin, Sayyida Maryam. So that's one. Um, there's two very strange questions, but I have to say it. Someone told me, and I don't know who told you that, when children do ibadah, or any good or bad deed, listen to this one. A sawab with S, which means thawab, reward, goes to the father, not to the mother. La ilaha illallah, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Why is that? The reward will go to whoever taught that child. A mother, a father, both, an aunt, a neighbor. Whoever, addal ala al-khayr, kafa'ila. You lead, teach people to do good, they will get. Don't let people put this in your mind. Lower the stand. I don't know how this even. Now, look at the next one. Eid al-Adha. When we sacrifice animal, do we use mother name or father name? Who are you sacrificing for? You put them. Yeah, but are you sacrificing it if you're doing qurbani, not in hajj? Are you doing it for somebody else? Then you put that name. But there's no need of a mother or a father. Um, I think I answered everything. Um, the last one, am I okay? We talked about status of woman in Islam, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevated the woman as equal. This is a very important question. Why there, are, there have been such disparity between the status of men and women in history and even today? Who said so? Let's always ask this question. And you mentioned it beautifully in your talk. Karramna bani Adam, number one. Allah elevated the status of a human being. That's why I get so offended, I have a cat. When somebody look at me and says, oh, the mother of the cat, I was like, a'udhu billah. No, I really mean it because that's very common culture. And I was like, no, karamna bani Adam. Human beings are elevated. You are a human being, you're elevated. You're honored. That's number one. The status of men and women, it depends what are you looking. Culture, that's not deen. Learn to separate. There is things that men does, women doesn't do in deen, yes. The hikmah. There is wisdom. There is, needs another whole program about that. But as Allah elevated your status as a mother, I say this all the time, does the man feel inferior because you're a mother? Why do we feel inferior if we don't do things the man does? Did you get my point? Don't let this go into you. You have been elevated status by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one, as a human being. Number two, as a woman. Mother or not a mother, but in general, in his own way, subhanah. And we are equal in the reward and what we are going to be asked about. We're just hitting up on Maghrib. Okay, really, really quickly. Um, all of the questions I have about, are about family. I have, uh, given the sacredness of the bond between mother and daughter, what does it mean? Uh, or look like to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while setting boundaries and pulling away from a mother that is abusive and cruel. I have another one that is similar. How, as a Muslim woman, do you resolve working with immediate extended family that are not Muslims or not practicing individuals? And give us tips on how to raise children. Okay, that's a different question. Uh, I want to say one thing about family because there's more questions here about family. You are stronger than you think. You are more powerful than you imagine. Take charge. Take charge. I don't understand why we, there are women that spend half of their lives waiting to get married and then half of their, the second half of their lives complaining about this, this, the person they married. If you agreed to go into this relationship, then love this person, be kind to this person, contain this person, be there for this person, make peace in this family. The whole idea of family in Islam is for there to be a peaceful place to raise children. If you're not up to it, then to start with either don't get married or pull out of a marriage if you, if you possibly can do so without, without uh, great disasters happening to all the members. You are stronger than you think. Take charge. You are the person that sets the emotional environment of this family. You can make it peaceful. You can give this man what they need in order for him not to feel threatened and, and uh, aggressive. You can give, you can create an environment where the children can grow in a peaceful manner without feeling uh, 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 like they live in a place that has no walls. 
if you have a strong relationship with Allah, your strength, where does your strength and power come from? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you turn to Allah, subhanAllah, my mother-in-law had 11 children, 10 which lived. And one day when my children were giving me a particular hard time, I went to her and I said, please tell me, what is it? What is it that you did? What is the secret that you had these 10 very, very successful children, five women who are da'iyas, five men who are all physicians, and very upright men, what did you do? And she said, come, let me show you. She said, I read lots of books, and I heard lots of theories, but come, let me show you the secret. And she took me into her bedroom, and she said, you see this narrow strip between my closet and my bed? I said, yes. She said, I spend hours there praying every night. It is dua. Connect with Allah and see the power that you have. Take charge of the family. Feel pity and kindness and empathy, not pity, empathy for this cruel mother. Why is she cruel? What kind of a life did she have that she would be cruel to her child? So you're gonna, you, you want to, I mean, hold a grudge against someone that is, is, is denying you the, the most spontaneous and, and natural feeling ever? Take charge. Make the places that you live in and the places that are around you happy places peaceful places, places where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rida upon you. Alhamdulillah. Happy news update. Uh, Sister Edelin, who is in charge, I believe, of convert care here at MCC, has contacted Sister Liz and Sister Julie. Sister Liz is in Oakland. Sister um, Julie is in Sacramento. And I think they've taken their shahadas by now because it's been some minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so alhamdulillah, it's always nice to end a program that way. Uh, I wish they were here. Yes, I wish they were here so that we can hug and kiss them and give them all our love and ask for their du'as if you're still listening. SubhanAllah, remind me of the hadith of Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam. La yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahida. خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمُرُ النِّعَمُ To Allah guide through you one person. This, he said this to Sayyidina Ali. Way better than all the, the herd of a red camel, which is very expensive these days. May Allah reward everyone who put any effort in this. This is not because of the speakers only, a'udhu billah. No. This is because of the idea. Number one, Allah's tawfiq. Number two, the place, the, the board member. The Rahma Foundation, Jannah Institute, the speakers, but most importantly, you, and I will end this, La Uzakikum Allah, is the Sadq fi Talabillah. When you are sincere in pleasing Allah, see what He gives you. Did we expect this? Did we came to plan this? Yaftah Laki. He opens to you from where you don't know. Have this faith and see what wonders. If He guides through one, one day these people, He will guide your children. And will he guide many other people? We need to do such that shukr at the end for, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have one more piece of happy news, mashallah. Uh, uh, one of our dear local teachers, uh, Ansani Had, some of you may know her, mashallah, is currently in Medina Munawwara, uh, currently visiting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and was messaging with Sister Sabine earlier, and knew that we were all gathered here, and so she relayed salam to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam directly to, uh, from, on behalf of us directly to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah bless and increase and allow us all to be joined there. Inshallah, next time gathered there, visiting him and visiting, inshallah, the Bakka. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Uh, if you want to partake in the um, planning of this event, all you have to do is take your chair <laughs> and put it back in the conference room, and you are an organizer of this event, inshallah, taking the blessing of the shahadas and the knowledge that was imparted today. Um, but we are going to do closing dua and then maghrib, insha'Allah. I asked, yes. She's your teacher. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> well, I am not good. I, I don't do this in public. Yes, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Rabbi Laka Alhamd, Rabbi Laka Alhamd, Hamdan Yariqu Bijalali, Wajhika Wa'adhimi Sultanik, Rabbi Ma Qadarnaka Haqqa Qadrik, Wala Abadnaka Haqqa Ibadatik, Rabbi Salli Wa Sallim Wa Barik, Ala Sayyidina Muhammad, Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi, Tasliman Kathira, Rabbana Taqabbal Minna, Innaka Anta Sami'un Alim, Tub Alayna, Innaka Anta Tawwabu Rahim, Rabbana La Tuzuk Qulubana Ba'da Idha Hadaytana, Wa Hab Lana Min Ladunka Rahma, Innaka Anta Al-Wahab, Rabbana Hab Lana Min Azwajina, Wa Dhuriyatina, Qurata Ayun, Wa Ja'alna Al-Muttaqina Imama, Rabbana Ja'alna Mubarakina Ina Ma Kunna, Rabbana Gfir Lana Dhunubana, Wa Israfana Fi Amrina, Wa Kaffir Amna Sayyatina, Wa Tawafana Ma Al Abrar, Rabbana Taqabbal Minna, Innaka Anta Al-Sami'un العليم تب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه تسليما كثيرا